If a person says they don't see color, run because they don't see you. To go through the world in a black body, it's an experience that black folks understand. Lazy, ¿cómo estamos? Estamos bien, gracias. Esta idea de Afro-Latinidad, our diaspora y cosas así. You studied this before, am I right? Yeah, and in college, I took an anthropology sociology class, and and it was about the African diaspora uh, in the Spanish-speaking countries of the Caribbean. And this was the first time in a classroom setting that I heard anything about our African ancestry in Latin America. It helped me in a moment where I was really struggling with my identity to understand myself. What is the your intention in this video and what is that you want to get out of it? Well, I really wanted to give the spotlight to these experts and these scholars who have been studying the history of our people, have them explain in their own terms where we came from, the current mm -hmm. moment that we're living, anti-Black mm -hmm. racism in, in our community and how it has affected the culture and the society in which we exist. I do master class. <laughs> exactly. masterclass. Exactly. Hi, we are the Brujas of Brooklyn. We are identical twin sisters. My name is Dr. Miguelina Rodriguez. Hi, I'm the other half of Brujas of Brooklyn. I'm Dr. Griselda Rodriguez Salomon. And we are both professors of the social sciences within the City University of New York system, or CUNY. I'm a PhD student in the Joint Program in Africana Studies and History at the University of Pennsylvania. I'm a longtime educator. Uh, I'm Hilda Llorenz, and I'm an anthropologist at the University of Rhode Island. I'm an associate professor. And I study race and racialization and uh, gender in mostly in the Hispanic Caribbean and among Latinos in the United States. As Black Dominican women, there will be no DR, there will be no Haiti, there will be no Quisqueya and Haiti. Fortunately and unfortunately, if it wasn't for the transatlantic slave trade. The transatlantic slave trade, we call the Middle Passage, enslaved Africans who were captured in, in largely West and Central Africa to the Western Hemisphere. Right, Blackness started on the Western Hemisphere in what's today the Dominican Republic and Haiti because it was a slave port for almost 200 years before the United States became involved in the slave trade. And uh, Latin America at one point, and actually still today, uh, had more enslaved people than the United States did. As much as you want to straighten your hair and you Sammy Sosa's out there lightening your skin and getting surgery to, you know, reflect more European white features, ese negro sale porque sale and it's going to come out, it's going to come out in your babies, right? And I think that when you learn the rich history of the African, West African continent, was other than I studied abroad in Senegal, West Africa, in college, you realize like, wow, wow, we are a black people, but sadly we've been robbed of that aspect. People are not born slaves, people are enslaved, right? And so that's a big uh, linguistic thing to think about when you're uh, talking compassionately about African people who were in fact enslaved, right? Because they were made into something. So it's important to recognize that the language, right, and the manifestations of anti-blackness may change when you go across any, into any different country or place. Anti-black racism in the U.S., the reason it is different is because it has been codified right into the legal system of the United States. In the United States with Jim Crow, separate and of course not equal. In the United States, there were, you know, there were clear laws and zone, even zoning laws, real estate laws, right? Red, you know, all of these things that were in place to separate the so-called races, right? In Latin America, those things have never existed in the books, in, in, in the legal system. However, it has always uh, existed or it exists today in the structures, right, of, of the country. The differences that makes it a little tricky is that in, in Latin America, like in the U.S., but it's more prominent in Latin America, we have something called the pigmentocracy. And it's literally a hierarchy based on pigment. If you go to Dominican Republic or Colombia, Argentina, Guatemala, the lighter skinned people that look more European tend to be the ones that lead the political parties and have the 
power, you know, um, and the darker you are, you're more associated with poverty and low levels of education. In, in Latin America, we have this, the myth of racial democracy. And in the United States, a governing principle is this one drop rule, right? If you have a single drop of black blood, you are black. The underlying logic behind both of them is anti-blackness because we have the racial hierarchies in any country in this hemisphere. And guess who's at the top, right? Whether it's white Americans or white Puerto Ricans or white Peruvians or white da 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 da, it's the white folks at the top. And guess who's at the bottom? Lo right? negro. There you go. And the darker you are, the more enclosed you are. So you're, the darker you are, the smaller Right, your world is because you're enclosed. At the end of these day, the, the day, our ancestors, our relatives have been taught that to be lighter skin means survival, means a better life. In Latin America specifically, the darker skin that you are, the more racism you experience. So skin tone is really paramount, right? To experiences of racism, discrimination. Colorism is not just this abstract idea, it's actually very, uh, has real consequences, right? The lighter you are in Latin America, the more privilege you have, which means more access to jobs, schools, education. I'm definitely seeing now in this moment that Latinx communities are struggling with the language to address anti-blackness. Whenever anybody, black, brown, orange, yellow, purple, starts a conversation with, listen, I'm not racist, but I don't see color. I don't see, why, why are, Listen, y'all, if a person says, and I'm gonna do this, if a person says they don't see color, run, because they don't see you. Ay, que, que negra más linda. Tu seres linda, pa' ser negro, que negro más fino. And with, with my family, I'll speak for my family and, and my, my acquaintances, they will find the most ridiculous thing, ay, Dios mío, que negro con los dientes más lindo. <laughs> that black man has beautiful teeth, like, but they won't say that about a white man because the white man in their eyes is complete and whole and beautiful. Although well-meaning, they're backhanded compliments. And when you call someone out, it's like, well, but I, I didn't mean anything. And it's like, well, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. Todos somos iguales, todos somos boricua, todos somos, somos dominicano, right? And essentially the logic there is that we can eliminate racial inequality, right? By ignoring racial difference, right? We are all from X community, and so we're all equal, right? But that doesn't change the reality, right? That Black Latinx folks have different and specific experiences than non-Black Latinx. Nancy Lopez talks about street race. I love the concept. The question is, what's your street race? And the street race, what it means is, what do people assign you when you're walking in the street? And so, for evidently Black people, Right? Like the people who cannot, in Latin America, a lot of us can wiggle out of blackness. These people cannot wiggle out of blackness and therefore suffer. Now, my job as somebody who has a little bit of, of light skin privilege, right, is to listen and to validate those experiences rather than saying, but well, that's not true because there isn't racism here. But how do the ideologies of blanqueamiento and mejorar la raza promote uh, white supremacy? And how do we move beyond this to black affirmation? There's a painting called The Redemption of Ham. It's about a Brazilian family, right? And you see a dark-skinned black grandmother with her hands raised to the sky, as if she's thanking God. You see her daughter, right, who is lighter skinned. She's still visibly black, but she's lighter skinned. You see the daughter's partner, who is a white man, and you see the child who is white. And this demonstrates the aspirational movement generation by generation towards whiteness. These ideologies like blancamiento and mestizaje are very much colonial, they're very Latin American rooted. Blanqueamiento and mejor la raza are aspirational ideas that manifest in dating practices, right? And who you choose to partner with, but at their core are white supremacist ideas. I'm still in the process yeah. of forgiveness because they just didn't know better. And to them, that was like a ticket out. It was a ticket out where like somewhere, somehow having a lighter skin grandchild was somehow gonna not only get them out of the situation they were in, but it was also like, I don't want you to endure what I had to endure. They didn't have the language, right? They didn't have the privilege to unpack all of the hate 
that was brought up upon them. And that's why it's our duty. That's why Griselda and I go so hard because we don't have an excuse. You know, a lot of my work is in phenomenology, which is this idea that our oppression and domination happens in the mind more than in anything else. So if you get people to think like a white person, I'm gonna be very like simple in my in my explanation, then you've controlled them because you've disassociated them from their true self. So this idea that to be successful, you have to not only look white, but then think white and engage the world in a very European way, which is very individualistic, very like competitive, um, self-made, I think that's one way in which we're indoctrinated and we're kept oppressed. I think it's important to, to recognize that mejor la raza and all that is internalized violence. And so how do we move to, to black affirmation, right? It's for black Latinx folks to write, draw, record, and amplify our stories in our own voices. As Latinx folks, I think it's important to remember that, you know, Miga is always clear on this, that not all Latinx people are black, but for those that are, it's about doing your homework. We're very big on like reading, Read. reading, reading, doing your research, doing your homework, and also embracing the parts of your lineage that are of African descent, whether it's from Mexico or Dominican Republic, in your own way, there's no formula. So that five generations from now, they're not wondering what their their black Latinx great-great-grandfather or grandmother were thinking or, or feeling at the time, right? Let's give that gift to our future generations. To be unapologetic and like, you know, express your blackness in however you feel it's correct. To those that don't identify as black, or even if you do, let other people uh, embrace their blackness however they want. It's really unsettling to me what I'm seeing now is seeing the reverse colorism within the Latinx population where there's all these like police coming out, like policing people's blackness. Like, oh, you're not really black because you're light skin. You know, whoever's listening to this and needs to hear this, we have to be very careful on the way we go about trying to relay these messages because it's starting to sound very divisive. If you're a lighter skin, Latinx individual and you happen to be in a space where race is being discussed, do not keep your mouth shut. Yeah. For non-Black Latinx folks, buckle up, it's a long ride, right? Assume that you engage in anti-Black practices, because you do. The question isn't if you do, but how you do. Because anti-blackness is woven into our cultures and is perpetuated in our everyday lives. Work to recognize, deconstruct, and unlearn those habits. If you're not sure, you should go to a workshop because those workshops exist. So if you hear your mom or your dad or your tío, you know, or your cousin saying racist things, you know, calling them out, it doesn't have to be confrontational. You can just say, hey, you know, I don't know, I don't, I don't like that. I, and you know, and this is the same thing for you know, anti. LGBT uh, Q comments. It's the same, right? We have to be consequential. We have to follow through. If we say that we believe in justice, we have to act it out. We do need allies. You know, th there's this rhetoric that like, we don't need allies. We need allies and we, wel we welcome allies. Right? The thing about allyship is understanding, and I always say this, and I'm, I'm about to write the, the publisher house of Pedagogy of the Oppressed to start getting a cut, because I keep <laughs> pushing that book so much. The liberation that we are seeking right now, the, the uprisings that we're, we're living through right now, they need to be headed by the oppressed, because they're the only ones that know true liberation, because true liberation only comes from living through these experiences. So we have to listen and validate rather than invalidating and acting like they're crazy because they are not. These are real experiences, right? And then we have to check our part in this system. Follow, listen, and to support the work of Black Latinx folks who have been doing this work for years. If you're a non-Black Latinx person, what they are writing about is not for you to confirm or deny or challenge, right? This is about the Black Latinx experience, right? It's time to listen, it's time to learn, and it's time to dismantle the kinds of violent thinking and behavior that has existed for centuries within our community. It must, it must must, must be rooted in love. There's a lot of anger 
but sometimes we allow the rage to cloud our heart space to the point where we don't give people the benefit of the doubt. And even people and people are gonna be hearing this and they may be like, that's some weak ass sh Then that's, that's, that's some weak ass to you then. I would like to see more intentional collaboration and community building across the African diaspora, right? Now, oftentimes, and I'm guilty of this too sometimes, we imagine that in our ethno-national communities, right, we are most welcome, right? And yet there are limits to that. Because when I go to Puerto Rico, and they're like, tu no eres Puerto Rico, tu eres Dominicano, right? Because I'm too black to be accepted as what Puerto Ricans look like. The people who understand our lived experiences are not just the ones who are from our ethno-national communities. To go through the world in a Black body, it's an experience that Black folks understand, regardless of the, the flag that they rep, the language that they speak, or the place where they were born. And I'm not saying that people are not building community across the diaspora. People are. I just want to see more of it. Invest in our communities, invest in each other, care for each other, and do all this while we are alive. The Haitian Revolution, the people who fought, the revolutionaries who uh, got rid of, of the French in the colony, uh, really kind of set the spark on a global scale. These movements that we see today are the result of that, right? So even in Latin America, where we say, oh, that you know, it seems like we're, they're so far behind, and the answer is yes and no. It seems like they're far behind, but they're, they're actually Actually, a lot of work that has been and is being done by Black individuals in Latin America. I'd like to see more Black Latinx histories written and told by us that center us and show the many textures of our lives. If we don't uproot things with love by looking at the people that are being negatively affected and the system and the people and groups that are negatively negatively affected, we could we could burn this motherfucker down and create a new world and it's gonna be the same thing in a matter of decades because we didn't deal with it at the root. Follow like.